are at war with Japan. Failure will make him inch by inch and that he shall not enter upon our country. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Welcome to the Australia Remembers podcast. My name is Michael Madden. Joining me today is Iraq War veteran, photographer extraordinaire, and all-around top bloke, Gordon Trail. How are you, Gordo? Yeah, good, Michael. That's, How's things? Yeah, good, mate. Going good. Uh, this is our very first episode of the, the podcast. Uh, today we're talking about um, the book we both worked on, The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers, and this uh, this episode is... Proudly brought to you and sponsored by TPI Victoria, that is Totally and Permanently Incapacitated Service Men and Women's Association of Victoria. So a big thank you to TPI. Um, if people who aren't aware of the book, um, the book is called The Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. It's based on our 100 Victoria Cross recipients, being Australia's 100 Victoria Cross recipients. Um, a job is about four years in the making, Gordo. Yeah, it certainly was. It was, it was about two years of my uh, uh, life that it took to uh, when I came on board. So, yeah, it was fantastic. What we'll do, we'll give people a bit of an idea, uh, um, first of all, of, of who we are, yep. um, what we've done and where we're heading and, and what we want to achieve with this podcast. Um, for me, I'm, I'm an author and a metal mounter by trade, which means I, I mount medals. Um, I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, as in when you see people wearing medals on Anzac Day mounted on their chest, that's what I do. I stitch them together. I do replicas and the originals. Um, been writing f all my life. I've written four novels, and, and this book is my first nonfiction, um, uh, the biggest book I've ever been involved in. And the idea um, to do it as a not-for-profit um, was fairly clear, and we'll explain that shortly. Um, and my dad is a, a Vietnam veteran. Dad's TPI is totally and permanently incapacitated from his service in the war. Um, hence, uh, th this book being donated to that organisation. Gordo, you uh, you were in Iraq in 2004, is that right? Mate? Yes, so I was in uh, Baghdad in 2004 and uh, spent my time with uh, 57 RAR, which is the Royal Australian Regiment. And uh, our role was uh, part of a security detachment, which was uh, we looked after the Australian ambassador and his staff so that they could carry out uh, their duties in a uh, war zone, which was uh, Baghdad. And uh, we used to make sure that they were able to uh, get around Baghdad in a safe manner. And uh, they usually consisted of uh, a couple of... Uh, uh, ASLAVs, which are 13 ton uh, vehicles, and in the middle of them, there'd normally be about three vehicles in a uh, convoy, and the ambassador would get around in his uh, armoured up uh, BMW. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a pretty uh, pretty hot time over there at that stage, both weather wise and also the local uh, population and. That. Yeah, it's, you and I have gotten pretty close over the last couple of years and we've never really talked about no. your your service much. We're always talking about other people's service. <laughs> um, yeah, but you, you wanted to be um, in the Army as a kid, didn't you? For, yes, yeah. so I was uh, four years old. I can remember I, I was uh, always playing around with uh, soldiers and uh, little Bren car, Bren gun carrier cars and so forth. And, uh, what about I your knew brothers it, and... Yeah, well, my oldest brother, he was in the uh, Navy at that time as well, so he ended up going to uh, Malaya, Borneo and Vietnam. And your old man was a veteran too, wasn't Yeah, he, was, uh, he spent three years in the uh, Royal, Royal Air Force in, uh, and he spent his uh, three years, as I said, in uh, Burma and uh, India. And, uh, and I look at my short time that I was in Iraq and he, he was away from home for three years, so it would have been pretty hard on him, and, but also terribly hard on, on my mother, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> what we've done with this book. Um, yeah, sure. So about four years ago, I set out to, uh, to photograph all 100 Victoria Cross medals. 
uh, in the flesh to photograph all 96 of the graves of these men. Um, they are all men. Uh, there's no Australians or no women at all have been awarded the Victoria Cross. Uh, there's only four left alive. Also to try and photograph every statue and monument that I could find anywhere on the world. Um, anywhere in the world. And the big challenge was to try and try and interview at least one family member uh, for each one of these veterans, or as many as I could. And that was by far the biggest challenge, being that there's no record anywhere of where all these families are. There's no directory or anything. So I sort of figured if I could get 15, 20 families involved, that would be huge. And I think we ended up with about 60 in the end, which was pretty enormous. And yeah, it was great. It was great. And I, I was working with another photographer early in the early days, um, a very professional man. He was very good at what he did. It wasn't quite the right fit. Um, and we decided that it was perhaps best if we started using veterans, particularly TPI veterans, to create this book and um, to help me. And, and I'll stress the fact that I'm not a veteran. I've never put on a pair of army boots in, in my life. I think I'm about the only one, Gordo, in this whole book <laughs> who's <laughs> involved in this book who's never served before. Yeah, you're a sippy, as we call them. <laughs> yeah, well, Gordo, that's how we met, wasn't it? Michael Williams, who's the CEO of TPI, said to me when we were sort of talking to him about this, and he said, oh, I know just the bloke. Yeah. Yeah, I got a phone call about two years ago and said, uh, Gordon, would you like to come in for a bit of a chat and uh, about a book? and a project that uh, TPI have uh, got on on the horizon. So I went in there and uh, Michael started talking to me about it. And and because I'd spent 28 years in the Army, I uh, and he said it was all about the Victoria Cross. As soon as he said that, I, I was in for sure. Yeah. There was no second thoughts about uh, should I think about it for overnight no, I thought of it for one second and then straight away I just went, yes, I'll, I'll do it for sure. Yeah, I remember that. Um, I remember Michael, no, I think you had brought your laptop in and you had some of your photos mm. that you showed me and as soon as I saw them, I thought, oh yeah, apart from the fact that this bloke uses a cannon, he probably knows what he's doing. <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> Gordo we all and I, can't have uh, good cameras like <laughs> Canons, can we? And, uh, Gordo and Maybe I they'll sponsor of, us one day. Yeah, there's a thought. Yeah. Uh, we're a bit of a running joke on Nick on his Canon, and we're always fighting over who's better. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to win that fight. Yeah. But you showed me some of your pictures you'd done. Um, I was pretty impressed, to say yeah. the least, mate. And, and that really gave me uh, confidence uh, as well when I after showing you those uh, images and showing Michael those images as well, that uh, that you felt comfortable with uh, me behind a lens and that just encouraged me to uh, to do better and bigger things. And and uh, the book is the uh, end of end result, which has come out really well for both of us. Our first interview that we did together was, um, uh, it was... George Petrie, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, George. Yeah. <laughs> he's become a great mate of ours. Yeah. George, if you don't know who George Petrie is, is a, he's an artist and a graphic designer. He's a he's a ripping bloke, a really good bloke. He's been very supportive and he's been with us ever since the day we met. We went out there. Gordo set that up, didn't you? Yeah. How would you meet George? Well, it was through uh, Ken, who uh, works for Legacy. And uh, Ken had met George uh, at a uh, function and, and he got talking because they're both Greek guys and that, Ken, and uh, George. And uh, he said to me, uh, look, he rang me up the next day, uh, Ken did, and said, look, uh, I just met a artist who you might be uh, looking for, that he paints World War One soldiers and, you know, and it, it won't hurt if you give him a call. So I rang George up and we spoke for about an hour and a half, I think, the first time. And then I spoke to you and said, look, there's uh, George Petru, he's an artist and he paints uh, World, War, World War One soldiers. So I knew that we had 64 Victoria Cross recipients during the First World War. So I thought, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go and visit George. And he started through the Lost Diggers of Indian Court through yeah. um, Ross Coulthard, who's become friends of ours as well. And Ross has been involved in the book and... Uh, He's another good bloke too. We've yeah. been pretty lucky, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. People have, 
And I think that's come also from uh, the way we've approached the book as well and also the not-for-profit. You know, we're not out there to make a million dollars. We're there to tell the stories of these uh, 100 Australians. Let's know. talk about that because, <clears throat> excuse me, T- TPI, um, you're a TPI veteran yourself. Yes. Uh, as yep. I said, I've, I've never even pulled on a pair of boots, but Dad, I can speak about what they've done for my dad. Yeah. Um, dad uh, didn't have a good time in Vietnam or afterwards. Uh, he was, I think, from memory, it was actually the VVA, uh, VVA, AA, no, uh, VVA, yeah, yeah. VVA, big yeah. pardon, uh, who, who helped Dad. Um, w- our family was homeless for a few years, I think, in probably the early 90s. Um, we were in a bit of a tough spot, um, and VVA got Dad, helped him get his TPI pension, which I think was something that he didn't think he was entitled to or deserved. Um, they were fantastic, and that organisation has sort of dissolved mm. over the years, and a lot of them have moved into the TPI Association, which Dad's now heavily involved in. And the difference that that group has made to our family, I can't, I can't explain that. I can't, yeah. If it's not something you've experienced, um, they're not a benign ESO, ex-service organisation. They're um, they're effective, are they? Yeah, absolutely. What what they've done for the veteran community from straight after the First World War and they're still continuing. They're, they're about the same age as what the RSL is. And, uh, you know, during Second World War and, and the First World War, we had uh, females uh, in as nurses and, and in Vietnam as nursing. And, and now, today, we have uh, frontline troops and there's uh, a lot, lot more uh, females as well. So... Their TPI are there to help these uh, people on their return if they need the help, that is, you know. So, And they're always out there. And uh, one of the good things that I've noticed in the last couple of years with uh, TPI Victoria is being how they're uh, wanting to re- reconnect with the younger veterans, which is really uh, makes myself uh, very happy because... You know, these younger veterans, they've been around and they've served in maybe it's a little bit different today compared to uh, Vietnam or Second World War or the First World War. Whereas today's uh, cohort of uh, younger veterans, they've been maybe uh, off to six different types of deployment. They could have been in uh, uh, Solomon Islands on a peacekeeping mission. They could have been in a war zone in East Timor, Afghanistan, Iraq. And, you know, they they all come back with some sort of different take on, you know, their their uh, army life. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's encouraging that they're looking to the future because they're going to need those younger veterans to support them and take them forward. Yeah. And, well, let's hope that... Uh, that we can help with this book if, if people want to help TPI. Um, the easiest way to do it is to, to buy the book. Um, they, they've thrown their weight behind it in a very aggressive way. All the money from this book goes to TPI. Um, the publisher is not taking any profits from it at all. As an author, I can tell you that that, that is very rare. Yeah, it, and I think we should uh, mention who the uh, publisher absolutely, is as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Big Sky Publishing. They run out of Sydney, and uh, Denny Neve, the uh, publisher, he's uh, also a uh, serving uh, reservist soldier who's uh, been deployed overseas as well to Afghanistan. Yeah, they've done a good job, and they haven't held back on the production of the book. And um, to try and put into perspective, as far as we can sit here now and try and think about, we haven't had a chance to catch our breath pretty much since the day we met. This has been such a, an extraordinary experience. It, I was hoping to take this little bit of time here just to take a breath, sit back and say, Gordo, what happened? <laughs> what just happened? Wow. Because there's some news that, that even is coming out like last night and yeah. things. Yeah. That... So uh, why don't you tell us that uh, story, Michael, about uh, Keith Payne? No, I'm going to hold, gonna oh, hold that gonna one. Hold that I'm going to hold that okay. one. We'll uh, hold that for our next uh, podcast. Hold that for our next podcast. Yeah, Hopefully that, we'll have something yeah. really nice to say. But Keith, what, what I can say about Keith, um, who's become a friend of ours, uh, Keith, if you don't know, is our last surviving Victoria Cross recipient from Vietnam and our last Imperial VC. 
he's a he's a good bloke, Keith. He now with this book there was a lim- there's a limited edition that are numbered one to four hundred. Keith, this was completely Keith's initiative. He offered to present number one to Her Majesty the Queen and number two to Prince Charles. Um, this was to happen at the Victoria Cross George Cross reunion in London, I think two days, two or three days before the royal wedding with Prince Henry last week. And um, Prince Harry. Prince Harry, yeah, there you go. Shows how much of a royalist I am. <laughs> uh, he, he did a good job. He, he uh, Him and D- uh, Doug Baird helped out as well. And uh, it was well received, very well received, so I believe. And we've got a, a nice photo of um, Keith and Doug with Prince Charles holding the book. So, um, and... In, originally, Her Majesty the Queen was going to write the forward for this book. In fact, people don't know this, um, but the forward was written f- um, for the Queen, um, ready to go. Somebody intervened at the last minute because um, the way it works now with her is she won't forward or do anything like this um, with with any association that she's not associated with. So obviously she's associated with the Victoria Cross, it's, it's her award, um, but she's not associated with TPI Victoria. So her, her people contacted us and said, look, we're really sorry, but she can't do it on reflection. She can't do the forward because she doesn't have that connection to TPI. Um, but as a caveat, they put in there, well, um, look, um, how would you like to come to Windsor Castle to view the prototype Victoria Cross, which, um, <laughs> which after I got off the floor, I um I said, yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So we did that, didn't we, mate? Yeah, we certainly did. And uh, my wife tells a bit of a funny story about that. She uh, rang me the the morning that we were going to uh, go to Windsor Castle, and I'm I'm at the uh, Victory Services Club uh, ironing. Uh, my, uh, not uniform. Oh, gee, I can't get out of it, can I? <laughs> uh, I was signing my uh, white shirt and tie. This is in London. And tie and uh, my suit. And she goes, why, why are you wearing a suit? She said, aren't you going to Windsor Castle? And I said, yeah, we're going to Windsor Castle. She goes, why, why the suit? And I said, well, we're going into Windsor Castle. She thought, oh, I thought you were going to the outside of Windsor Castle <laughs> to take photos. So, uh, yeah, we we get up to Windsor Castle there and uh, we went to the uh, visitor's entrance and they said, no, you don't belong here. You, you've got to go around to the special entrance and that. So we walked through the gates there and uh, got our official passes. It was a pretty hot day too, from my recollection. And, uh, yeah, we were... Uh, taken upstairs and uh, we were shown the uh, Queen's Curator's office and as we walked in, there's this beautiful red silk uh, cloth covering the table and in front of us was the uh, Queen Victoria's prototype, uh, Victoria Cross, sitting on the on the uh, red silk and next to it was the very first uh, Victoria Cross that uh, Queen Victoria awarded and... That's right. And the bloke said, there's the prototype. Yeah. Don't touch. I'll be Don't back in touch. a minute. And he yeah. walked out of the room and left us in there. Yeah. So Michael and I were looking at each other and we're thinking, is this a test or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was pretty tempted to pick it up and put it in my yeah. pocket. But uh, no, yeah. you show, you, you're showing a level of trust like that yeah. um, from the Queen. Uh, those thoughts don't even enter your head, do they? It, it's no. just awe. And, yeah. and, and we're standing there and, and there it is, the prototype yeah. that was made in um, 1856 yeah. 50, yeah, uh, by Hancocks who make all VCs um, and they sent that to Queen Victoria as an example of what they thought the, the cross should be. And you can see... A photo of that in the book too. That's right, in yeah. The early uh, part. So. She only made a few little changes. She put some laurel leaves along the suspension bar and a little V beneath it and, and that was it. She, yeah. And from what that curator was saying is that that is one of the fam- royal family's most prized possessions. It's why it's in Windsor Castle, not in lock and key with the with the crown jewels like yeah. everything else. And yeah, both Michael and I, we thought when we were going to uh, see the prototype, we were expecting to go into a museum and see it behind uh, the glass, and and uh, but to see it in the flesh and to actually hold it. Uh, Right, really, since uh, I had uh, goosebumps for sure. 
Yeah. And was... after that, the, the second thing we, we did there um, mm. was we got to go into the vault in Shropshire where uh, people yeah. seem to know. Um, the, some, yeah, some... I, I was going to say about uh, when we were in Windsor Castle, the... Uh, we were given permission to use uh, Queen Victoria's diaries. So That's right. Do you want to have a bit of a chat about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Th that was an experience and a half. Uh, the, the curator said to us that you've been given permission to use Queen Victoria's diaries in in your book. Um, and again, once I picked myself up off the floor, I said, <laughs> what diaries? Um, turns out that they had published uh, Queen Victoria's diaries just a few years ago. And uh, those can only be accessed and read from the United Kingdom. You can't see them here in Australia. So nobody here really even knows they exist. I certainly didn't. So they said, yes, you're allowed to use them um, in any way you feel fit, but you will have to, uh, you'll have to access them and take what you want while you're in the UK because when you go home, you'll no longer be able to access them. So we were travelling on charity money. We were under the pump. We were filming, shooting, interviewing, travelling, very, very big days. So I'd have to get back to my hotel room at night and open my laptop and start reading through Queen Victoria's diaries, looking for any reference to the Victoria Cross, which um, I basically didn't sleep for three days. It was, but that was interesting because um, I really got to know her from those diaries because she, she wrote pretty much every day about the veterans that she was meeting during the Crimean War, not necessarily decorated ones, but just, just people, blokes had been, been wounded and she'd write about, um, you know, little Cecil who lost an arm at Sebastopol grabbing that gun and a sailor who'd lost his legs. And she'd remember they'd be brought to the palace to meet her and, and she'd remember their names and what happened to them. And she'd talk about how that felt. Um, and you got the sense from reading those diaries that she was the real deal. Like she really cared about her service people. It was, and again, this is her private diaries. So she didn't know anybody was going to read these. No. Right? She had no idea. So there's no pretense. This is honest. And you really got the feel that she, she was the right person in the right place at the right time. When Lord Penmuir and the others brought the idea for the Victoria Cross to her, um, she was, she was going to make sure that it was done properly. And she did. Yeah. It was, uh, Really good. And, and that leads on to the uh, cover of uh, the book. Down the uh, spine of the uh, book, there's uh, where it says the uh, Victoria Cross Australia remembers. There's faint uh, writing underneath that. And uh, Michael's put that there as a, uh, as a thank you to uh, Queen Victoria. So when you pick the book up, have a look at it and and inside there, there's also some uh, excerpts of her diary, and she was a pl prolific uh, writer. She was a beautiful writer too. Yeah. It was really, yeah. really easy to read the diaries. Yeah, <clears throat> and as I was saying before, we went to the base in Shropshire as well to um, to see the the Victoria Cross metal. Um, as people know, I think a lot of people know that the Victoria Cross is made from cannon. Um, the legend says that it's Russian cannons that were captured at Sebastopol and melted down, um, and uh, the VCs are made from that. That's not entirely true. We, we found that out as well. They're actually Chinese cannons, so... <coughs> yeah, Chinese-made cannons. Sorry, Chinese-made cannons, yeah, yeah. that were captured in, in uh, the Crimean War. There. Yeah, so. and they, they, they haven't been melted down. The two of them, they're sitting uh, in a in a museum in England. What they did is they took the castor bell off the back, which is the big, the big round bit at the back of the cannon, which they used to secure ropes to, to control the, the violent recoil of these weapons. And they just slice a little bit off that. And they take that to Hancock's. Hancock's melts that down and makes the VC out of those. Mm. And that, what's left of that castor bell is about the size of a head, Gordo. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty uh, heavy chunk of metal and uh, the, when we went into uh, Shropshire we go to this uh, Ministry of Defence site and you know it's got barbed wire ringed uh, uh, fences and then inside there there's a big massive warehouse with uh, uh, like uh, prison bars on the all windows and so forth and inside that there's another room and inside that room there was a uh, another safe and inside the safe was this uh, 
uh, timber box and in with a huge padlock on it. So, and that was then inside of that is what's uh, the last chunk of uh, metal for the uh, Victoria Cross. So, and uh, we were one of we're the only Australians ever to uh, go into that vault and pick up the uh, metal and take hold it and get our, you know, our iPhone photos <laughs> for us <laughs> so we could post on Facebook and that. So, Can you remember but, what that yeah. was like when you oh, picked it up? Wow. And uh, just was, for the record, Gordon yeah. and I were ready to start throwing elbows, <laughs> but I was the first first one in the vault. Yeah, I did say, <laughs> no, you, you did all the hard work getting us into uh, Shropshire. So it was... Uh, it was a really proud moment to pick the medal up, you know, and to see what the uh, Victoria Cross is made from. So, yeah, it was really good. And the people there were just amazing. Yeah, they were good. Yeah. Um, we, together, I think, we're trying to think how many interviews we did together. Uh, we, we actually videoed um, a lot of these videos, some of them, are a lot of these interviews, some of them are on the um, Victoria Cross Australia Remembers YouTube channel that people can, can go and watch. Some of them aren't. There's quite a few there that I actually haven't had the time to upload yet, and I'm not too sure what we're going to do with those all these interviews, but there's a lot of material there. Mm. and um, We interviewed people all over the country. Um, how many? What, three widows? Yeah. Yeah, we, we three it, widows of Victoria Cross recipients yeah. um, killed in action. Yeah. Um, I don't know how even children, as in first, as in the actual children of World War One VCs, which I didn't think there'd be as many as there were. But there's the Barellas, There's um, there's quite a few. Yeah, uh, Murray. Yep, uh, Harry Murray. Murray's, yep. Yeah, Harry Murray's. Yeah, uh, Harry Murray's daughter who lives in uh, Queensland. Uh, Barellas, uh, and yeah, it's just a. Uh, the, the people that we met was just incredible to uh, talk to. And uh, while Michael was doing the interviews, I was, I'd be listening to these interviews and I'd be going through the memorabilia that they had uh, on the tables and so forth. And uh, I'd pick up, uh, like when we were, went and spoke to Jill at uh, her house, uh, Magars, uh, I picked up a uh, mention in dispatches and... And as I was gleaning my eyes across the uh, mansion in dispatch, I uh, I went straight to the bottom right hand corner, and there was uh, Winston Churchill's signature on it. And then the next uh, piece of memorabilia I picked up was the uh, Distinguished Service uh, Order uh, for Magar, and that was signed by uh, King George the Fifth. And I'm thinking, how many? P and I start to think, and I was thinking, how many people have actually held this? Uh, mentioned in dispatches or DSO and and they were in such pristine condition and I you know, I'd probably has it I guess maybe ten people if would that, have held it. Yeah. If that yeah. It yeah. it's that's a rabbit hole we can go down too, yeah. the memorabilia. I mean jeez. Oh, but in actually it was the Magar family again, um pardon me. Um with Jill, uh she she had um, people who don't know, Leslie Mago uh, received the Victoria Cross in the Boer War. Um, and he, he served in World War I and he was at the charge of Beersheba, the famous charge of the Light Horse. He led, um, I, I think from memory, the decoy charge. Um, and after the, the victory, I think he was, uh, he was on horseback giving orders to his men and a German aircraft came over and in the old days, they literally used to lean out of the cockpit and drop bombs by hand. And this guy had flown over a few times. He was giving them a bit of trouble. And he dropped probably what was his last bomb and it fell and it hit Leslie on the shoulder, on the left, left shoulder. I could be wrong, but I think it was the left shoulder. It didn't detonate. A lot of people thought that he died as in from the explosion. It didn't detonate. It severed his arm and his horse took off. Uh, and he later bled out. I think the bandages came loose, and he he died from his wounds when he was re after he was recovered. But Gordar was going through this old box, and he brings out these two little yeah. I saw clips. these uh, uh, his uh, rank insignia, which are what we call in the uh, military his pips, which uh, go on the shoulders. And and I said to Michael, I said these are the original uh, pips that uh, Colonel uh, Magar wore. And 
you know, and they're all a bit crunched up in uh, some of the areas. And You could uh, see where it'd be yeah, hit where they are dented and damaged. Yeah. yeah, so when you're holding this type of memorabilia and knowing the the soldier that wore them as well, it was just, uh, used to, I used to get so many goosebumps uh, with some of the memorabilia that we uh, did did uncover during our uh, journey. And his dog tags are on eBay yeah. now at the moment, which yeah. is something else that... Um, yeah. which we've looked into. We, we've set up a, we're trying to set up a Victoria Cross Family Association and Trust for all this, which is going well. And one of the things we're currently working on is trying to recover those. I think the bloke's got them for about 17 grand, which is... Yeah, yeah but he's a, a genuine collector yeah, who... Uh, yeah, we've looked into it. It's all legit. We, we've managed to trace them back to um, the family. So what happened when Leslie was killed, all his bits and pieces went into a little box and it was sent to his brother. Um, and then I think at some stage the brother gave it to his neighbour, the dog tags to his neighbour as a favour. So we've, and they've sold a few times. So we've, no one's done anything wrong here. We've got to stress that, but it's not a good look. Um, th- this collector is above board. He, he, he's, he's well within his rights to sell them, but we would like to, to try and recover them. And um, give them back to the family. Give them back to the family who I think they want to donate them onto yeah. the war memorial anyway, but if anyone's got a spare seventeen thousand dollars, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Big ass. But that, uh, there's so many stories like that we came yeah. across, and this was all through the families. Yeah. They have these memorabilia. That um, Harry Murray's daughter. We won't say where we saw these things, where they are, but the bits and pieces that she had for the dads were staggering. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'd just been down to uh, Tasmania a couple of weeks beforehand for a. Uh, a uh, service uh, uh, for Harry Murray, and there was a statue down in uh, Evendale, and uh, this statue is done by Peter Corlett, a uh, Melbourne uh, uh, sculptor who has done amazing work. His sculptures are just fantastic, and I love them. And uh, when I was down there, I, because I was taking photos, of course, I, I got to know he had his uh, old World War One tin helmet on. He had a... Uh, a short sleeve jacket and underneath that jacket it was a leather jacket and underneath the jacket was uh, uh, sheepskin and uh, on the on his chest he had a mat bag uh, around his neck and, so mat uh, bags uh, like yeah. a, a leather pouch on a yeah. long yeah lo- like a modern day man bag yeah that's right <laughs> yeah and yeah. and what what the officers would carry their maps they would put them in these uh, leather bags and so forth and and it's the uh, statue depicts uh, Harry throwing a grenade and, or as they used to call them in World War One, bombs. So, uh, you know, I'd just been there. And then when we went and spoke to uh, Clem Murray, his daughter, she actually goes, oh, I've got some of uh, Dad's stuff. And and she starts to pull out, here's this uh, World War One helmet. Here's the, the map bag. Here's the leather jacket. The uh, sheepskin wasn't there though, but uh, the gas mask. Yeah, the gas, yeah, mask. gas mask. Yeah, it first still, World War One gas mask. It still mask. had, yeah, it yes. still had charcoal in it. Yeah. That he would have probably had mud, mustard yeah. gas in it. Yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, so those uh, things really uh, piqued our interest, and uh, you know we, we were pretty excited about it all. But uh, yeah, that's good. Well, but, get, yeah, go but going back to uh, the uh, book, Michael. How did what? Why were you fascinated by this uh, Victoria Cross? Where did it start? Was it Dave Spackman in your ear about uh, <laughs> uh, medals and so forth? So yeah, <clears throat> just tell a little bit of tell okay. the listeners a little bit about how you got started about the Victoria Cross and why. Probably, um, Albert, I've been obsessed with Albert Jacker for a long time, and yes, David Spackman, a friend of mine, is probably responsible for a lot of that. I used to work with David many years ago, and we used to get in trouble because we'd be uh, we'd be standing together talking about Jacker and World War One and things, and we were supposed to be working. But um, he's a VC tra- tragic in the purest sense. That Dave is, uh, and he really um, got me interested. And in, uh, if you ever want to research a bloke who I cannot believe that there has never been a, a movie made about Albert Jacker to this day. I do not understand it. One of the best books you'll ever read on any Australian veteran is uh, Hard Jacker by Michael Lewiski. Uh, 
he is an incredible Australian, um, one of the best soldiers we've ever produced. Um, I would say it was through through Jacka, and then learning about the Victoria Cross and and what it means and what the history of it that that it it is so unique, like we talked about the way it's made, um, and the way that it's uh, the actions are vetted, that uh, you know it's it's unlike anything else in the world and. Through my own family, uh, Dad being a, a Vietnam veteran, my grandfather was a captain in New Guinea during World War Two. My great grandfather and his dad, my great great grandfather, both fought on the Western Front. Um, the elder of the two was shot at Polygon Wood through the stomach and the shoulder. And we were over, when we were over there, we went to uh, Scott's Post at Polygon Wood, which is the pillbox that he was shot trying to take um, in the 59th Battalion. Uh, he survived, um, luckily. Uh, so that's probably where that all started, I suppose, around the Victoria Cross and uh, being a medal man, like my obsession with medals as well, it was around before that and it just strengthened it all in my relationship with Dave and uh, with my hobby as a medal man to grow and into a business. Um, I'd written four, uh, four books as well, novels, nothing like this one. Uh, so it was a two natural passions, medals, well, three medals, Australian military history and writing, and there's no better way to put them together than to write a book about the Victoria Cross. Uh, but what's the point? Because there's been so many of them done. But what was pretty evident to me was that there, nobody had taken the time to do the photos properly. Number one, being obsessed with medals. I wanted to see the medals as they are today. Not You can find old archive photos of them years ago. I wanted to know where they are and what they look like now. Yeah, so with that, we uh, ended up going to the Australian War Memorial after uh, hours there, and uh, we got about three hours, and i tell you what, oh, it really worked my butt off. <laughs> you when I came out of there, I was hanging for a nice cold glass of water, I tell you. It was like, it, there was around about 77 there at that stage, now they've... Uh, had a few more added to it since then for the centenary of the Armistice. Uh, so there's about 85 or so in uh, at the War Memorial at this present stage. So yeah, that was uh, that 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 was a pretty good highlight too, wasn't it? Being in there, there after hours, yeah. What a privilege to be in in yeah. the War Memorial and and um, thank you to them and Nick yeah. Fletcher in particular. There was set that up for us. I think we ended up doing that two or three times. So let yeah, us we there. did. Uh, well, I, I knew that we had to go back and uh, shoot Keith Payne's uh, medals. Needed a uh, wide-angle lens for that one. Yeah, I needed to go out and purchase <laughs> a new uh, lens to capture Keith's, I think he's got 24, is it? 24 I think so, medals? yeah. I think he's just been given another one. Yeah, um, for, for Korea. Korea. Yeah, there's a new Korean medal. If there's any Korean veterans listening who aren't aware of it, that the one that was issued by the South Korean government, I think, um, many years ago has now been approved by the yeah. Directorate of Honours and Awards for wearing. Yeah. So that has to go on. So that's good news. Um, they take their time, but at least it's approved. Actually, one thing I remember, which is f funny with hindsight now, we got um, the, Bris the museum in Brisbane have three Victoria Crosses and they were moving them. Look, Gordo was just talking about how the war memorials acquired some extra VCs for the centenary period. The three from the Brisbane Museum were getting moved down there and they sort of rang us and said, hey, we're going to get these things out from behind the glass. Why don't you come and shoot them? Because there's one thing to shoot them through the glass like we did at the war memorial, but to hold them in your hand and have proper control over the light, um, not only is it better for the photography, but it's a better experience if you're trying to create something that is artistic because you, you get something from holding a Victoria Cross and we, we both did that and, and I remember... At that stage, I'd held a few. Gordo hadn't, and he walked into the room, and um, I videoed all this, and um, I've never seen a met man sweat so much. <laughs> so when he held that first Victoria Cross in his hand and was preparing to shoot it. And <laughs> and, and I was, my hands were pretty shaky as well. And uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'd say to Michael, how am I going to shoot this? And he goes, don't worry, you'll be right. Just relax, and it'll all work out well. And uh, yeah, it was uh, that was a pretty another highlight but there's been so many highlights uh, with this book and uh, you know we, we just just don't know which one's the it blurs the in a mess highlight. doesn't it yeah yeah when one thing that's worth talking about is when we went to the um, to the to the UK 
we th- there's eight blokes buried over there, yeah. VC recipients. So part of there's the job. About sixteen on the Western Front. Right. Yeah. Uh, so part of the job, obviously, is to shoot those graves, and um, some of the graves were not in the best condition, to put it mildly. Yeah. Um, they're pretty ordinary. Two blokes um, weren't even. There, there's um, two two guys there being cremated. And the ashes put on one of the remembrance lawns, and they're supposed to put little plaques there to commemorate where they are. Um, the plaques have been gone and missing for, we think, 50, 60 years. So there's absolutely nothing there. So you're talking about an Australian Victoria Cross recipient. There's nothing. There's no tombstone. There's no memorial. Nothing. Um, so we would just jumped off the plane at this stage. Uh, we got into Heathrow, and then we got our uh, rental car. And we jumped straight straight in there and off to the uh, uh, crematorium where the uh, stalky was supposed to be, his ashes were scattered uh, throughout the uh, nice, beautiful lawns there. But uh, but there was no plaque and then uh, we went looking for the other one and there was nothing there as well. So That's but, been amended now. Yeah, that's, yeah. And that was through uh, Alexander Downer, who was the Australian High Commissioner in in uh, at Australia House in London and uh, yeah we had a pretty good chat to Alexander Downer and, he was a good bloke uh, yeah he was yeah really uh, he, he was a bit surprised that uh, that he said what what do you want to speak to us to me about uh, the Victoria Cross and uh, Michael goes well uh, the Victoria Cross GC uh, Association said that uh, you have a love for uh, the Australian they recommended military him. history yeah. and yeah and he was uh, quite quite an interesting character to speak to and he spoke very highly of the uh, younger veterans the three uh, living Australian Victoria Cross recipients Mark Donaldson uh, Ben Robert Smith and Dan Kieran when he hosted them at a uh, function in at Australia House a couple of years previously yeah so yeah, and he was instrumental because some of the other graves we found, like Harry Murray, was in such disrepair, was sinking into the ground. Oh. It had been fixed. Oh, Neville House. Sorry. Beg your pardon. Do, do I say, yeah, sorry, yeah. Neville House. It had been fixed a few years ago by the Victoria Cross Trust, but it had since fallen into disrepair. And the big problem we were finding is that the, the lawns weren't being maintained and the weeds weren't controlled. So I think Bell was the other one. Yeah. Um, where you couldn't actually see the grave. So we were sort of crawling around in the dirt and the rain, hands and knees, pulling out weeds so we could photograph these yeah. um, these graves. And long story short, we've can- managed to connect um, um, the Victoria Cross Trust over there, who is a charity. Yeah, Gary uh, Stapleton. Gary Stapleton, a really nice bloke who runs that. Um, and again, thank you to Alexander Downer, who threw his weight around um, yeah. and got, yeah. got people involved. And this situation is now fixed. Yeah, and right at the end of the interview, he goes, oh, yeah, I've got a... He, he said to uh, Michael, he goes, now, when you go and visit uh, St Neville House's grave, make sure that you let me know what, what the grave is like. And Michael goes, oh, is there something particular? So you could finish yeah, off Yeah, well, he story. said he was... Um, I don't want to get it wrong. He's, he's godfather to Sir Neville's um, granddaughter. Grave. Yeah. Great granddaughter. Oh, granddaughter, and he just yeah. told us, "What would you talk to me for? I've got no connections to the Victoria yeah. Cross." And the so, more we spoke to him, he did, and, yeah. uh, which is why he was recommended. But he put his weight to it, um, and the Australian War Graves Commission stepped up, and I believe they're now funding the Victoria Cross Trust for who are going to undertake ongoing maintenance and, and lawn care and things. So yeah. that's another good thing that's come out of the book is that we've fixed all those graves and they'll be looked after. So if people go. And look at them. If they're in country, they look nice, um, yeah. and that's important. If we can't look after Sir Neville's grave, yeah, who was our first, yeah. then we can't look after anything, can we? So, um, and it's under, and it's not to kick the palms because these are in public cemeteries. Who, you know, there might be thousands of graves in there, and some of them are thousands of years old. Um, they're only one of many, so. It's not that they're not just looking after Neville's. They're not looking after any of them. Mm. They don't maintain them to the level that we do over here. So it's not about putting pressure on them. It was about finding a solution to, okay, we don't want to fix your whole cemetery. We just want to fix this grave and make sure if any expats come over, 
that he, he looks nice. Mm. And, and when you talk about graves, we did get to uh, visit a lot of graves during our journey and so forth. But uh, uh, trying to find, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack, I tell you, when some of the uh, cemeteries we went to. and uh, We spent a long time crawling around graves in the last couple of years, haven't we, mate? Yeah. And uh, one of the things, uh, a mate of mine, uh, uh, Daryl Burns, uh, I served with uh, Daryl when I was down at Portsea, uh, he'd been over to the Western Front a few times and uh, he'd used a lady over there called Danielle. And Danielle was, she just does this out of the goodness of her heart and she just loves the military history of uh, World War I and, and the Western Front. And uh, Daryl suggested that we ask Danielle to uh, c- come and be our guide. So I'd sent her a uh, list of graves that we had to go to of the VCs in on in France and Belgium, and she wrote back and said, "Oh yeah, that'd take seven days to do this trip." So Michael and I rock up there, and uh, we said to Danielle at, right at, at the start, we said, "Look, we got to do this in three days," and she just looked at us like we we're mad Aussies. Where are these crazy guys come from? How can we do this in three days? Twenty-two but, sites. Yeah, twenty-two sites. Yeah. But also uh, along with the, um, uh, Michael and I going, George Petro came along as well. And, I, and George paid for his own uh, his own uh, fare and so forth. And him and Zed, his wife, had come along. And uh, and I was, it was really interesting, uh, George coming along, because, it was, you know, he wanted to get the feel of what the uh, ground that these people were on, you know. Like, there's a uh, image that he's painted of... Uh, um, Martin O'Meara, and in there, there's the uh, Posiers where uh, Martin O'Meara went out into no man's land and he saved around 23 people, uh, 23 soldiers, and brought them back in. And so he really got that, that feel of it. And uh, one of the highlights for George, of course, was uh, go to Bird Angles. So <laughs> you can tell the story about Bird Angles. Oh, uh, Bird Angles. Yeah. Batungla, is that how it's Yeah, spent? Batungla. Batungla. That's the, um, the chateau where, um, where Monash, Monash was knighted. Yes. Uh, was knighted at the, at the front yeah. of this. Yeah. yeah, we went there and uh, apparently the, the diggers used to call it Bird Angles because yeah. they couldn't say Batungla. Yeah. A, it, it, it's spelt the same, I think, as uh, Bert Angles, but yeah. you know, the French call it Bertongla. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, we also, uh, it, with the connection with uh, Vinicor, the uh, Lost Diggers, mm. um, Kerry Stokes, who owns Channel 7, he uh, he gave Ross Coulthard a, uh, a check and said, look, uh, can you go and find these uh, images uh that keep on turning up uh, sporadically around the place. And uh, so uh, Ross went over to France and he eventually found them in a uh, place called uh, Vinicor. And that that was probably about two or three miles from the uh, Hindenburg line where the they used to rotate out the battalions from the front line into these uh, villages back from the, from the uh, Hindenburg line so they could rest and recover. And there was this uh, photographer and his wife, and they would take uh, photos of uh, the Australian soldiers. And how they got to know about these photographs were the um, the backdrop. And uh, it was so on our tour, we just had to go there. And uh, and now that that actual farmhouse is being made into a museum, and uh, that that was a pretty special place because. Uh, one of the first uh, glass plate negatives that came out of there was uh, of uh, Joe Maxwell. That's right, yeah. Yeah, he's what I call the naughty VC, old Joe. He he lo- used to like to play up a little bit. Hells, Bells and Mademoiselles? Or yeah, he wrote that book, Hells, Bells and Mademoiselles, but uh, it was... And it was amazing how many award, uh, like military awards for... Uh, as a hero, he uh, he he got within a twelve month period. About twelve months, yeah, yeah. It was just amazing. He was an amazing soldier. And it's amazing to think we're writing about these blokes. Um, you know, the, the actions that they do, the the extreme valour that they yeah. show to be awarded to Victoria Cross is 
um, for me, who's never served, um, obviously never seen action, um, it, it beggars belief what mm. these guys do. And one thing I, I hope <clears throat> that we'll get out of the book is that I, the way I see it and what I understand from talking to the families and the diggers themselves is when they get out of a trench and go and do the things that they do, they're not doing it for their country. They're not doing it for their flag or their king. They're not doing it for an award. They're doing it for their mates. They're doing it for just normal soldiers like my dad and like you. And they're the people that they were trying to help. And the money from this book goes to the TPI. It it raises money for totally and permanently incapacitated veterans. So the way I like to see it is that it, through this book, these blokes and through their actions, they're still helping normal soldiers. And somebody like you, you know, what, what... What's it sort of feel like to be, you know, to to learn more about what these guys have done and compare it to your own? Not compare what you've done, but as someone who has fought in country and fought for the country. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it was a humbling experience for me to uh, you know because I always say I've always said thank you for the people who have been uh, before me, who served with me, and the ones that follow me, and. Uh, and knowing that the TPI is there to help people who uh, at times can fall on hard times, such as uh, PTSD and, uh, you know, have uh, injuries and so forth. And and if it wasn't for the TPI Association, you know, there, there'd be a lot more uh, uh, troubled veterans out there. So you, you joined the Army... Uh, how old were you when you joined the I was 19. I was in 1975. I went to Kapuka, uh, spent a couple of months there, then was posted to 57 RAR, which initially was my very first unit and also my last unit uh, that I served with in Iraq. And uh, in 1970, so I got there in 76, started 76. So they, uh, they were all predominantly uh, Vietnam veterans, the corporals, the, the sergeants, the warrant officers, and boy, they were hard ass. <laughs> they, they, they had no no qualms about giving you a smack around the ear if you didn't pull your weight and, uh, you know, and they built team teamwork, you know, because with uh, the military and uh, you look at it differently once you get out of it eventually, but... Uh, when you're in there, it's all teamwork, you know, and and as you said, Michael, it's uh, you do it for your mates around you, you know. If there's a job to be done, everyone, right, let's go and do it, yep. and uh, yeah. And you left the army. Yeah, after. I left the army and uh, ended about ninety eight, ninety nine, and uh, yeah, I I'd, I'd served, and I thought, oh yeah, I'm gonna kick back a little bit now and do something different. And then uh, September 11 happened. So Where were you that day? Oh, you? I was at home and uh, I woke up and saw September 11 unfolding in front of my eyes. And uh, six weeks later, I was back in uniform. It, it, it was just a sense that I had to go back and do something because, you know, I thought if it happened, happened in America and we had Australians lost in that... Uh, that uh, tragic day uh, that it could happen in Australia. What did China think uh, of it? Was it well, Gordo's yeah, wife? Was it you yeah. spoke to her about it? Or is yeah. It... Well, I just sort of looked at her, and she basically knew that. Uh, yeah, I'm going back in the system. So yeah, six weeks I was back in uniform as a warrant officer. How old were you then? I was uh, 46. Yeah, Bloody 46 hell. then. Yeah. So what the hardest part was the beep test that I had to do to come back in the army. Uh, it was pretty. Uh, Were you fit still? Or you... I was. Yeah, I was still pretty fit. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, 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 I was fit. So how did you 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 went back with the aim to get to Afghanistan? Uh to go to Iraq. Yeah. For yeah. Iraq, not yeah. for Afghanistan. Uh, uh sort of Afghanistan. They'd sort of cleaned that up with the uh, CIA at the start of. Uh, uh, you know the two thousands and so forth, and that that wasn't the big Never picture stuff. Down. Yeah. yeah, but uh, so uh, when I went back in after the, as I said, September eleven, uh, I got posted to uh, Vic Barracks, 
and to a desk job. And in that role, we would travel around Australia and we'd spend a month in each uh, state uh, running out this new program for uh, the rationing system and so forth. And uh, so you're, when a, I, you're a cook? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was a qualified chef when I uh, joined the army. He and, still hasn't cooked me a meal, but no. I keep hassling <laughs> about it. Yeah. So, yeah. And, yeah. So uh, when I uh, uh, was in uh, Darwin, uh, we, uh, I said, right, this is the place, and, and my old team was there. So when it came for postings... Uh, so you I thought said, Darwin was the best, most yeah, likely posting yeah, for you to absolute, get sent overseas? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Uh, during the uh, period when I was out, team were already come and gone, so... But that was more as a uh, peacekeeping nature at that stage. So, and I knew that uh, Darwin was the place to go to uh, be sent overseas. So, within a very short while, in two thousand and four, I we went up to uh, Darwin, and uh, we, I was told, oh, probably within the first two months that I'd be uh, deploying to uh, Iraq as part of security detachment. So. What rank? Oh, it's a warrant officer. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was a bit unusual that, uh, like that uh, as a caterer, to go there in this uh, uh, way of, uh, with the setup of SECDET. Because how they run, like during Vietnam, you'd have A echelon, which would be, uh, you'd have the fighting trips at the front. And a couple of miles back, you'd have the uh, rear echelon where you'd have the cooks, the uh, uh, medics, you'd have uh, the Q store people and, and so forth. And so they never basically used to venture into that uh, fighting zone. Whereas today's war, you go as a mini battalion, basically. So in, in that like sect that was comprised of infantry, uh, cavalry, medic, uh, signals, cooks, uh, and Q-store people. So we're one little uh, unit. So All carrying weapons. And yeah, yeah, together. yeah. And uh, we would we would carry, every, we carried a weapon with us and even to the shower and so forth, uh, you, your weapon was only one arm, arm's uh, length away from you at all times. And, uh, and when we first got in country there, uh, we really knew that how hot it was going to be. Uh, like when we flew into uh, Baghdad International Airport on the C-130, it was uh, yeah, it was a pretty exhilarating ride down into there. And uh, well, and soon to... as the soon as the belly of the <coughs> uh, the plane opened, that heat just hit you like you wouldn't believe. And the smell, it, because every country you go to, there's always a smell about it. And uh, yeah. So then we'd uh, get in uh, into, so we got on the ground there and with, you know, fully decked out with uh, helmets, uh, body uh, armour and uh, and our uniform and so forth. And we'd get in the back of the ASLAV and uh, inside there, there was these white sort of curtain type thick material. And, and I said, oh, what's all this? And they said, oh, that's for small arms fire if it came through that this uh, ballistic uh, material would stop them bouncing around like a... Uh, on the inside? Yeah, on the inside <laughs> and that. And so I thought, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm really here, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, and then, so we'd sit in the vehicle, <clears throat> put the uh, the muzzle of the uh, weapon to the floor and you'd just sit there and... And uh, we got there very, very quickly. Uh, so we, would travel at, we would travel at around about 100 <clears throat> kilometres an hour... On uh, what year was this? What you uh, two thousand and four? So that's when yeah. it was bad in yeah. Well, Iraq. It was, that's where it got. That was the really yeah. It was twelve months yeah. after Saddam, uh, after the invasion of uh, of the uh, coalition got in there, and it was around about the time that uh, yeah Saddam was went hiding, and uh, yeah that was my aim to go and capture Saddam. So, but I couldn't get him. Never found the right hole? No, no, no. So, uh, yeah. So but uh, but travelling around uh, Baghdad, it was, uh, bit of, it was a bit unreal, you know, because we were travelling one one of the times that uh, we travelled along and you, you're looking through the uh, 
where the uh, gunner st- stands up and he uh, looks around for uh, any snipers or anything like that. So uh, he's the, exposed? Yeah, he's exposed. He's got his ballistic. That's his role. He's He's got to put up with it and that's it. And uh, we're driving down the road and the next minute we start to do a little bit of a fishtail. And I thought, oh, what's that? <laughs> And the sergeant up the front, he, he comes over the intercom. And he's laughing his head off. He goes, oh, some some local tried to run us off the road. Here's this 13-ton <laughs> armoured vehicle and this normal car, soft skin vehicle trying to push us over. Oh. And the and the tyres, you know, be, they just chewed up one side of his vehicle. Just so, spat him out the back? Yeah. yeah so that do, what was, do you do in that? Just keep no, driving? Just keep on driving. He's obviously trying to stop you, so you're not going to well, stop. Well, you don't know if that's the case, but... Our, our rules of engagement was if anything happens, like actions on, when they say about actions on, you just carry through and you drive through. Even IEDs and so forth. If there's an ID, you don't get out and start having a look at what your vehicle is because that's, that's the time when the uh, the opposition, so to speak, would take uh, pot shots at you and so forth. But as we're driving down uh, Rude Irish, it was, uh, you're looking at, outside and you and I've seen all these uh, gum trees and I thought, geez, I'm back in Australia here. Gum and trees? Yeah, gum trees. There's massive, lots of them in Baghdad itself. It's, oh. Yeah, a little bit of Australia in Baghdad. So. <laughs> Make you feel at home. Yeah, so... So where did you set up? Yeah, we're in... Um, in there's a peninsula where the Tigris River snakes through uh, Baghdad. Uh, so I knew about the Tigris River and the Euphrates, of course, uh, through history and so forth. And we were right in the centre of that little, uh, uh, like, uh, peninsula, right in the centre of Baghdad. And uh, because the Australian Embassy was situated right next door to this building we lived in, uh, which was a uh, eight-storey building. Looked like nice from the outside, but it, there was nothing inside. There was no infrastructure inside it. It was all concrete. There was, you know, so we had blast walls in front of the windows, which were boarded up. And what I mean by blast walls, we'd have uh, sandbag walls and we'd have HESCO baskets. These are massive baskets, you know, probably five feet across and about eight, six or eight feet tall. And they would be filled with uh, rocks and dirt and stuff like that and what that does that stops any uh, explosion percussion and so forth and uh, so it's for a safety reason and that so we uh, so we stayed in this uh, building and yeah we uh, so you set up a kitchen in there yeah there was a yeah little room there was there was uh, three toilet fans for the exhaust system so and in one corner... How hot was it in the kitchen? How hot was it? <laughs> uh, my wife used to call it the uh, Baghdad diet. You know, I came back pretty thin. <laughs> <laughs> the hottest day we had was uh, around about 55 degrees and the lowest would have been maybe 30-ish. So inside that kitchen when you're cooking... Oh, it's pretty concrete hot. And yeah, and, and, and at times we had to wear uh, body armour as well. Uh, because of, depending on what the threat level was, we uh, had to uh, put up with uh, extreme uncomfortableness. And you'd yeah. have to go out and source the food from local markets. Yeah, we. So. They had. Um, I, I had a uh, guy uh, Karim who uh, I still keep in contact with uh, through Facebook, and uh, and we'd source. Uh, fresh bananas and, and bits and pieces. And some of the, you know, because we used to use American rations and they would come in a 50-man ration pack and these 50-man ration packs would be uh, made into three bo- three huge boxes. You'd get a frozen component of it. And, and one of the uh, things in there was frozen uh, scrambled eggs. And I started reading the ingredients and the cholesterol was through the roof and I went nuts. Nah not going to use this. <laughs> so I, I would source fresh eggs and uh, fresh fruit as much as I could. And, uh, yeah, the... So did that involve going out into the markets in the morning? Yeah, there you... was some... Yeah, we'd take the... Uh, the, the there was a, the, some of the, the Q-Store guys and that, what they went through to get some of the 
uh, gear was uh, hats off to them, mate, with, because they were in a soft-skinned vehicle. Yeah. And at times, because it was a pretty vo volatile uh, place over there in, you know, and they would be putting their feet on the brake and there'd be times that the brake uh, liners would uh, burst into flames and so forth. It was, yeah, it, it got used a fair bit. Oh, wow. Yeah, because, you know, e everywhere we went, we, we went at, at top speed. Yeah, one of the uh, things I'd like to uh, tell some of the listeners was the uh, ice that we got in Baghdad. Uh, yeah, they were about eight feet long and they were about 12 inches in circumference and uh, right through the middle of the ice you'd have this brown dirt right through the middle of the ice. So we never used to wash anything in local water over there. I didn't even have a uh, sink in the uh, kitchen there. So Where did the ice come from? Uh, I, don't, I don't know where it came from. Probably out of the Tigris River, oh. which had three-headed fish, I used to say. <laughs> <laughs> everything went into the Tigris River, I, I can assure you. They never everything. went swimming in it there? Was, no, we didn't go swimming in there for sure. <laughs> no, but uh, the ice was to use. We had these big shippers, uh, big, huge eskies that because, as I was saying, we used to get water, uh, bottled water and also small cans of Coke and Sprite. And, and we had near beers as well, near beers, uh that the Americans got because we weren't allowed any alcohol over there as well. So uh, we'd have these uh, near, near beers. They'd be Coors and, uh, you know, Budweiser and so forth with no alcohol. And uh, one of the things that the Cowboys do in, as a, uh, a tradition is every, well, I think it was the Thursday night, they'd all get up there into their room and they'd have all these near beers and they'd be all telling jokes and everything else and they'd have all the uh, cigars because cigars over there, the Cuban cigars was uh, fairly inexpensive because everything that we purchased over there was quite cheap and uh, the American dollar used to go a long way. So, uh, yeah, we'd you'd walk in, you'd just open the door and all this smoke would come out of uh, all these cigars and that's But, uh, yeah, that... They had a lot of fun. Do you and like that was a Cuban I, cigar yourself? Sorry? Do you like a Cuban cigar no, no, no. I gave up uh, cigarette, uh, cigarettes and smoking a long time before that. So I wasn't about to start uh, taking up cigars. You know. But uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I had to wait until, the, uh, until I got home because there was no uh, video uh, DVDs uh, in that country before the... Uh, the the coalition came in, so that that just spawned a whole new uh, economic uh, uh, thing for for Iraq. So they uh, didn't have DVD players. No, yeah. no, but once the Americans and the Aussies and the Brits and the Poles and all that got there, they uh, this uh, this new thing happened, and you know I'd, I'd buy CD uh, DVDs for two dollars. And, you know, two dollars. It was nothing, and I and I remember watching uh, Man on Fire with uh, Denzel Washington, and just before the end, he's just walking up this uh, road bridge, and then all of a sudden, it stopped. The DVD stopped, and I had to wait until I came back to Australia to watch the, <laughs> the movie to see happened. the end of it. <laughs> yeah. You got yeah. a present uh, from a. A uh, very special person while you're over there too. I didn't certainly you? did. Yes, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough that uh, the Essendon Football Club, uh, through Kevin Shetty, who was the uh, coach at the time, uh, I got a, a signed uh, flag, Essendon flag, with all the uh, team of 2004 signed it with uh, Kevin Shetty himself, and uh, yeah. So that was, uh, and he he sent that over to Iraq into the yeah. red zone. Yeah, yeah, he sent it were. to me. Yeah, yeah. so I was. Uh, what did you do with it I, while you I, were there? I hung it up in the what, where we used to all all leap. So I used to hang it from the rafters, and if anyone went near it, they knew the warren officer was going to kick their butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, so, where is that flag now? Uh, I've got that at home now. So yeah, yeah. so it's a uh, pretty dear and. Uh, 
dear to my heart that uh, flag. So Sheedy yeah. gets it. I'm a Carlton supporter, so it yeah. pain, pains me to say a little <laughs> bit. But he, um, I mean, we both met him very briefly. Yeah. Um, he he seems to get it, doesn't he? He's yeah. the real deal, Sheeds, I think, when it comes to caring about veterans and everything he's done around Anzac Day and the footy yeah. and... You know, he seems to... Well, he was a Nasho, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he uh, served in uh, the Army during National Service, and he, he was an uh, engineer in Puckapunyal. Was he? And uh, he actually coached the uh, Red Roosters. That's uh, the logo for uh, the construction mob up there. And he coached them to a couple of premierships. So you played footy when you were in the Army, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did too. Did so, you go right? Yeah, I did all right. But, uh, you know, I probably preferred the uh, cricket more than uh, footy, but I still love both both sports for sure. So a few of the boys got hurt while you are in country, yeah. including yourself? Yeah, there was some uh, guys got hurt over there and uh, there was a, a rollover. One of the Aslabs got smashed up and uh, they were up in near Mosul and uh, they uh, some of them were actually uh, shipped out to Germany to the major hospital and so forth. So they went over over there and yeah, it, it's it's it was like a uh, empty feeling in the stomach when you heard that you know some of your mates were injured and so forth. But we were lucky that no one was killed during our uh, deployment over there. So you know. Now how are those boys going now? Oh, they're doing okay. Uh, some of them, uh, like a good mate of mine, he's got a. Um, a service dog that helps him out, and uh, he he was, uh, yeah, he's doing pretty good now. Yeah, so, that's good. And the service dogs are a wonderful uh, interaction with uh, veterans who can't seem to settle. How does and, how does that? What does a dog do? Yeah, you know, just look that they have this uh, instinct within them, and they're trained to uh, just. If the veteran is getting agitated or their voices are raised, the dog gets in between the the uh, veteran themselves and whoever's agitating the situation. It could be, you know, bloke down the road or someone, you know, you know, in the gas station or something like that. So yeah, and, and they, they pick up on signals. Or yeah, something? they they just calms it calms the uh, the veteran right down. You know, they'll jump up and they'll tap the shoulders and, and so forth. How do they know? Oh, that, I don't know. I'm not a uh, dog psychologist, but no, yeah. they just know. <laughs> no, yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. So it's a, so that's been a really good thing. And, uh, you know, and, and my mate, he uh, ended up on uh, uh, this year's, last year's Invictus Games, he went to uh, Canada. So How did he go? He did all right. He, what sport? Uh, yeah, he was in uh, archery. Right. And... Uh, so he's he's doing pretty good now. And, yeah, he's uh, TPI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, and th- and some of the other boys. What's his name? Uh, uh, Jason uh, Jinx. Good day, Jason. Yeah, and uh, my my offsider, um, which is a bit of a sad story. Uh, Steve Riley, he uh, he deployed about six times overseas to various uh, areas, and he was. So, Whip smart, you know, wicked sense of humour. One one of the stories you, yeah, I could tell about Steve is uh, one of the good things about uh, receiving mail. It really lifts everyone. When when we know that so what we got the mail bags and that, you know, um, everyone their spirits lifted and uh, to get a, a letter written from home and so forth. And this day, Steve gets this long parcel. And I'm saying, what's in there? And so he cracks it open, out drops a uh, driver, a uh, golf uh, driver, two wood or four wood, whatever it is, and uh, all these golf balls. And he goes, boss, I'm just going upstairs to one of the uh, vacant uh, uh, floors up there, and I'm going to rig up a uh, driving range. And I went, what? So this is yeah. basically downtown Baghdad. Yeah, this is in yeah. uh, downtown Baghdad. And uh, he, so he got some uh, shade cloth, got some timber, whacked it together with some of the uh, carpenter. We had a carpenter come out and help him rig it up, and he'd be practising his golf swings and so forth. So, And then because uh, we had a rooftop, and uh, 
Steve would be going up there and he goes, I'm just going to go and crack a few balls off the roof here. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one of my other mates, she's filming this and old Steve's cracking these golf balls. And I'm saying, mate, you know, it, I'm going to get a uh, a local coming with a big shiner and he's got a golf ball in his hand. He if goes, you're lucky. you guys are, you know, hitting, I don't know if they know about golf over there, but anyway, he was cracking these balls off. And, and the, uh, the, the rooftop had a, uh, a, a ledge, like a wall built around it. It was probably about four foot tall and so forth. And, and every time you went up there, you had to have uh, full, you had to have your helmet on and your body armor and stuff like that. And Steve's just cracking off these golf balls and he's smacking them. And my mate's filming him. And next minute, he cracks the ball. He mishit it. It went straight into the wall, came straight back, hit him right in the nuts, and he went down like a bag of spuds. It was one of the... And my mate's filming him, and he's shaking. <laughs> it's so funny. We've, we've got to put that video up. So oh, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> I've got it. I, I do have it on uh, tape, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, and I actually wrote a story uh, in... Uh, in one of Denny Neves, uh, Big Sky Publishing, uh, when he, he was asking for uh, stories f from veterans uh, about, uh, you know, their experience. So I sent him that story. And, and then he, <laughs> What did he, Steve think about that? Oh, Steve, he loved it. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Because he does, you know, he, he does a great... Has he had kids since that day or is he... Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, but he was one of the best chefs... I tell you, he was he was just an incredible. Like him and I together, we we just used to knock socks off the guys. We we ended up getting uh, uh, ice creams, individual ice creams through our connections. You got to know someone who knows someone who knows somebody else, and uh, we would also make uh, chocolate eclairs and things like that. And from and scratch, we, from scratch, and and like you've been holding out on me, Gordo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we 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 had pretty primitive uh, uh, equipment, but it was you know because the boys we would love that. Yeah, because we you know him, Steve, and I we really had it, uh, a love for our our guys. You know, yeah, because the, that's the only time that they tend to just relax a little bit more is the evening meal and that. So we wanted to make them you know, something special because breakfast in the morning, so they'd get up, they'd throw something down their throat. They'd be out on foot patrol or, or vehicle patrols and so forth. But, uh, and then lunchtime because of the temperature when we were there, we'd, we'd buy local, uh, Yoda ears. We used to call them. They were shaped like, uh, you know, those, like a, a star type flat bread. And, oh, uh, the Star Wars. No, yeah. Get Star the Wars. Yeah. 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 Those ears and that. So we used to get them and the boys would just, Bung, and we'd get uh, food and that, that. If I could get some lettuce or tomatoes or cheese or something like that, which was pretty hard to come by. Sounds like such a simple thing to us, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, but they uh, they but for the evening meal, we wanted to make them, you know, just relax and and feel at home. Like, you know, when there's a couple of the boys, they had their twenty first, and so I got them a birthday cake, stuck it in front of them. And I said, right, here's photos. I'm going to take some photos for you. Cause, and they go, what are you doing that for, boss? And I said, because his mum and dad will love that. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. So so hopefully they did send it home. and that, so, A good thought, mate, because yeah. especially at 21st birthday, they're oh, going to have uh, those photos. Yeah. And Who spends their 21st birthday in country? Yeah. You know, it's a rare thing, isn't it? Yeah, I was 48 when I went there. It was like going to war with my sons. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, I can imagine. But I tell you, those guys, some of them have gone on to bigger and big things and that, like uh, one of my mates, Jeff, he's uh, he's lives in Victoria. He's... Uh, he went and did a double law degree, and uh, I reckon that he'll be one of the prime ministers of Australia one day. So, yeah. Well, yeah. you'll always be able to say that you're his boss in Baghdad. Yeah, that's mate. right. That's all yeah. that matters. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Pull as long up. as they call me boss too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So w when when you come back when you come back home, yeah. you get um, for Iraq you receive two medals. I think it was uh, an active service medal. Or yeah, the Australian Iraq active medal. service medal. Yeah, and the campaign and the Iraq campaign medal. As a medal nut, as I am, how does did they? 
did they post them to you, like happened to 40 years later? No. <laughs> like happened to some of the Vietnam veterans, or how was that handled? Uh, that was uh, handled pretty good, actually, because um, uh, when we got back to Darwin, uh, Alexander Downer, in fact, he was the, I think he might have been the Minister of Defence at that stage. He, he was there to greet us at the airport and back at the unit. And we were given our double ASM straight away. So I had two gongs then. And then uh, when the Iraq campaign medal came out, we'd have a, a battalion parade and got that. And then the Australian Defence Medal came later on. So then, yeah. So, so they took the time to present them on parade. Oh, and Somebody pinned them yeah, up properly. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know with Dad, he didn't get his for years. And, yeah. Um, I think with a lot of them, they just sent them out in the mail. That's right, yeah. Particularly with Vietnam, they just yeah. didn't care. Yeah. But, uh, and a lot of the blokes still haven't claimed them yeah, all, so, all these years. And some of them just leave them in the drawers as well. Yeah, that's right. Again, I've, well, I've been a metal mounter for 15 years, so I've seen a lot of really sad stories with medals, and it's... I think when you when they present it to you like that, it must mean more to you than right. something that arrived arrived in the mail. Yeah, um, I don't think it's good enough that it was done that way in, yeah. uh, for the Vietnam blokes and others. You know, it's 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 a shame that that's the way it was handled, but it was. Yeah. And um, and it's it's interesting, sort of from my point of view, that the families that come to me with the medals every year. So I'd, a lot of them will bring medals that veterans have never worn that mm. they might have had issued years and years ago and they just didn't want to know about them for whatever reasons they put them aside and then they die and the kids pick them up and go well hang on these don't necessarily mean to me what they meant to dad um dad didn't want anything to do with them but for me as a son it means something else and yeah. you know they bring them in and they say what do you think and i think well yeah by all means get them mounted properly because they come in a separately, don't they? They yeah. come issued one at a time in a separate little box. That's correct. So when you see them mounted together in a row, that's yeah. what you bring them to somebody like me, or I think the army's probably got tailors who can do it for you. Yeah, I I, uh, I did get mine done by an air force tailor, and uh, it wasn't a very good job. Yeah, I so saw that. I, I ended I fixed up, it for you. Uh, yeah. Went went and took him to Michael, and he's done a cracking job. So Beric medals get there. <laughs> yeah, thanks so. for the plug, mate. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's and it's interesting. It's an interesting thing to talk about because um, every year after Anzac Day, I get at least one or two families um, come into my office and sit down, and they say, "Well, um, if something happened on Anzac Day. I was wearing my great grandfather's World War One medals, my dad's Vietnam medals, and um, for whatever reason, something happened. One fell off. Uh, you name it, I've heard it. I've heard it all. Yeah. Like." I got punched up, they got taken, I put them down at the bar when I was drunk, I, I fell over and hit my chest on a, a, a road curve, I even heard yeah. that, and broke them. I've heard everything. And they come and they sit in front of me and they say, what do we do? And the first question, obviously, well, is the veteran dead or alive? If it's World War One, you know, obviously he's dead. Yeah. And I then get to explain to them that, well, you, don't, you can't do anything. Once the veteran's dead, they do not reissue medals. There's no exception to that. Even if your house burns down, they're not going to reissue them. So why people, people should wear medals on, on Anzac Day. Um, so I'll be careful how I say this, but I, I think people should wear replicas, yep. not the real thing Absolutely. for that reason that like when a bloke or a woman's given their medals, you know, they might, they might have three kids, right? And then they're, they're you need you don't split a bloke's medals up. You don't do that. So you need to keep them together. You don't give one to this kid, one to that kid, one to that kid. They might have three. Like my grandfather was in World War Two. I've got his medals. Pop had five kids, and then I think there's about twenty four of us grandkids. And now with all the great grandkids, I mean, look, there might be seventy of us. Every one of those family members has the same right as I do to those medals. Well, they all ha they're all direct descendants of Pops, so they all have the right to wear those medals on Anzac Day, but there's only one set. Yeah. That. And I've got them, not because I'm the oldest, but because I had the, the keenest interest in the family, it was a conscious decision that they yeah. come to me. So what I say to people is, if they're thinking about wearing them on Anzac Day, is um, think of it from that point of view that they're not yours. You're the custodians, but you didn't, you didn't earn them. You don't have any right to wear them. What, the way it works is you're presenting yourself at the service on Anzac Day. 
on behalf of the veteran because the veteran cannot because they're dead. So you're there as a representation of the service. Therefore, the medals only need to be a representation. They don't need to be the real thing. It means the same thing. Mm. Uh, So what right do you have, this is what I say to people, to put those medals at risk on behalf of that other 70 people in your family? Mm. Or if it's a World War I veteran, there could be 100, 200 people descended from that person and you you don't have the right to put them at risk. So I always say to people, yes, do it, go to Anzac, go to Anzac Anzac Day services, wear the medals on the right. Um, only the the people, the medals are awarded to can go on the left. You have to wear them on the right. Um, but if I I get it to why people want to wear the originals, but it's a massive mistake. Yeah. and, And as you said, um, with the original medals, um, once they're lost, you cannot get it, them reissued no. to you. <clears throat> no. a- and to tell if uh, people out there don't know, how can I tell if uh, my uncle's medals are the real deal? So ha- what they do, they inscribe your name either on the back of the medal or at the base of the round uh, medal. On the rim. Yeah, on the rim. Yeah. And, and that has uh, the... Um, Serial number, your regimental number, and your name. So that's how you can tell if you've got the real deal. But, you know, I've got four kids, so I know that eventually I'm going to have four metal boxes with uh, four sets of replica medals in there for them so that they can pass down through their generation uh, to their kids and so forth. Yeah, and people overestimate what the medals are worth sometimes and I've seen yeah. some terrible fights in families yeah. over them and I get it yeah. um, because, of course, you, everybody wants them. There's only one set. You, you don't want to split them up, but there is one set and people often ask me um, to engrave them The because rep- they the only option is to make replicas that you can give yeah. to. Everybody can have a set of replicas. That's yeah. fine. Um, and people ask if to engrave them. I won't do it. Um, my understanding of it, it's not illegal to engrave replica medals, but it is illegal to try and pass replicas off as originals. So someone from the RSL might pull you aside if they see it and they probably won't see it. Let's be honest. Um, and say, you know, why would you do that? Why would you engrave them for any other reason other than to pass them off as originals? And I don't want to go down that that rabbit yeah, hole myself so i just sure. i just don't do it on the uh talking about medals and uh, uh replica sets and so forth uh for someone might know the uh, value of the victoria cross so if you could put into perspective some uh, values to say albert jacker's uh, set of medals and... well wow, that's a big question yeah. um the victoria cross particularly australian victoria crosses are the most valuable pretty much the most valuable metal in the world. They're, they're going at auction at the moment for um, one, $1.2 million more. Um, Albert Jacker, oh, they're in the War Memorial and they'll never be sold. But um, hypothetically, boy, uh, God only knows. Mm. Two million, probably. It's extraordinary because a normal set of medals, um, you got people think World War I medals are rare. Uh, they're not. Um there was 500,000 Australians issued those medals. Um, they're valuable, um, but they're not rare. Um, they are, they're worth money. They're not worth thousands and thousands of dollars unless there's something unusual about them. Like if it was, um, I mean, in my time, I've pretty much seen everything. I did a set for a, a guy who was, um, who was killed in the fourth wave at Lone Pine, um, 12th Light Horse. Um, no gallantry decorations, just the three World War One medals. Uh, they they'd be worth an awful lot. And then you put a, a gallantry award on it, anything from a mention in dispatches to a military medal, military cross, DSO, Victoria Cross, it just goes up exponentially. It's crazy. Yeah. You, it's just a, a fairly common, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but a, a, like the military medal, which is, is hard to get, but there's a lot of them, that can jump it from seven, eight hundred dollars to three, four thousand, five thousand, just, and then it just keeps going up and up. So it's it's hard to know. There's other medals sets out there, like Harry Murray, who was our most decorated veteran ever. Thankfully, we'll never find out because they're all in the War Memorial safe. But uh, it it does speak to the enormity of the Victoria Cross and what a big deal it is. And 
Um, for us making this book, one of the big challenges was to find all 100 feces, the crosses themselves and photograph them. That had never been done. And there was three or four of them that we couldn't find towards the end. And we'd met uh, Tim Britton. Tim is a Cross of Valor recipient. He, he got the Cross of Valor, which is the, uh, the Cross of Valor was introduced to replace the George Cross, which is the, the highest civilian decoration uh, you can get for gallantry. And Tim got the, uh, the Cross of Valor uh, during the Bali bombing uh, for, for his actions there. Good bloke, Tim, is a, is a, is a police officer in WA, is still serving, and he knew a bloke who knew a bloke. And we spoke to him, and he, he actually helped us find the last four uh, so we actually got photographs of all 100 Victoria crosses in the flesh, which had never been done before. And uh, Gordo and I, again, have had a little bit of a competition going about. Uh, I, I had him tipped, I, pipped. I think I held in my hand about 18 and Gordo held about 16. And I tell you what, holding the Victoria cross in your hand, it's a big deal. It, it, You'll never get that opportunity. If it, that opportunity ever presents itself to you, take it because you will never get that opportunity again. And it's this, they're only small. It's made of recycled bronze. You know, this bronze is so crap that, that when Hancock's make them, started making them in 1856, the, the metal was so hard, the dyes kept cracking. So they had to sand cast them and hand chase them to finish them. So they're all a little bit different. And this is very simple. I think they're quite beautiful, but I'm odd. Uh, bronze award. and But when you hold it, it represents everything, all the sacrifice and, and everything, all the history and all of it's in there. And you can almost feel it in the metal. And even though I claim victory on that little contest, Gordo claims it as well because he got to hold the VC and bar, which yeah. I've still not forgiven him for. Yeah, Charles Suppen, VC and bar, yeah. One and of I, only three people to be awarded the Victoria Cross twice yeah, in history. That, that was a pretty special one in uh, New Zealand. I went to Waiura in New Zealand, the Army Museum there, who were fantastic people as well, who... Uh, allowed me to uh, shoot some of uh, New Zealand-born, uh, but served in the Australian Army, uh, Shout and Storky and so forth. So it was really special. But and uh, every opportunity Gordo gets to show me the photo of him holding Charlie up in <laughs> VC and Bar, he yeah, <laughs> take you like... Absolutely. And what, what we mean by Bar is you, you can't have the same medal twice. That applies to everything um, in, in within the Commonwealth, including the Victoria Cross. Um, even the Active Service Medal, you can't get... You, you can earn that four or five times, but you can't have two. What they do is they put a little bar on the ribbon and it says Iraq, Afghanistan... His team or wherever you were with a Victoria Cross, like with other gallantry awards, it's a little bronze or with a VC, a bronze bar that goes across the ribbon yeah. to show that you've been awarded that twice. So 1,350, thir sorry, 1,360 Victoria Crosses awarded to 1,357 men because three received it twice. twice yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll, 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 hats off to you and I'll let you have that one, mate. But, uh, <laughs> but the book was, was launched, uh, in Bunjil Place in Narry Warren on the yeah. 21st of April, uh, 2018 with, uh, we had some great support from local people and the Berwick RSL and, um, and Susan Saray and some other wonderful people. And that was a day and a half, wasn't it, mate? Yeah, it was. Uh, we had over 820 odd people in the auditorium that day and, uh, they got to see a little bit of what uh, Michael, George, Michael Williams and uh, have done over the last uh, couple of years. So it was a really good team effort, I think. Yeah. We had uh, we had Ross Coulthard from yeah. 60 Minutes. Yeah, he was uh, the he MC. Was the MC yeah. yeah. We had, it was the largest gathering of Victoria Cross families in history. Yeah. Um, we had... 34 families. Yeah, 30, 100, so, 130 yeah, uh, 100, relatives. That's right. So rep, of the 100 VC families, we had about um, 34 there. And we just did Perth just recently. I think we had six families of Western Australian families represented by yeah. almost 50 people there too. So we yeah. had support everywhere. And we had um, on the launch in, in Melbourne, we had um, 
Mike, uh, Mike Brady, Mike Brady <laughs> from up there, Casale fame. Yes, yeah, he came and he actually was supposed to uh, premiere two songs at the Anzac Day game at the MCG, but he actually uh, he he did it for us. Um, and the second one he did, it was a song about his dad. And I tell you what, I don't think there was a dry eye in the house. That no, was a was, ripping yeah. song. Yeah, because uh, Mike's father and Mike, they didn't get along with each other. And it was, well, it wasn't until his, uh, Mike Brady's son wrote a book about his grandfather that uh, Mike Brady started to understand what it was like, what his father was and why he was like that. And so it was uh, a very moving song indeed. Yeah. It was, yeah. And, and the day was, we had a videographer there. There's a, there's a short promo of the day and there's a longer feature coming. Katrina Lawrence was um, the filmmaker who did yeah. that for us. Katrina's fantastic in this, this area. They did a great job. So hopefully that will be on our Facebook page in, in future. So we, we, there is a Facebook page for the book. It's the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers. There's a YouTube channel as well where you can see uh, the videos, the, some of the videos that we've done. As I said, there's still a lot in the can that haven't been made public yet and some really good ones too, I might add. Um, I'm not too sure what we're going to do with those. Uh, and th there's so much going on yeah. with this book behind the scenes. It is, yeah. I'm writing a uh, short essay of around about 3,000 words to what may turn into something else down the track, but uh, yeah, the book, the story behind the book. So the making of the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's been a journey and a half, hasn't it? So what's next, Michael? Uh, yeah, good question. Well, um, well, we do have something in uh, in the works. We can't talk about what that is. There's still a few um, a, a few things that need to fall in line, but we do have another project. And this podcast is something that Gordo and I are pretty passionate about. And we can talk a little bit about what, what we want to do with this um, uh, and what we hope it delivers and what it can provide. We, we do have some really wonderful people lined up to come in and talk to us in the future. Um, some very big names and, and just some, some normal service people as well. So... We will release those names um, when we get a little bit further down the track and a little bit more organised. But the idea, I think, is to give some veterans an opportunity to talk about their, their service like Gordo has today. And to th this podcast uh, being our first was to talk about the book, to give you an understanding of who we are and, and what we're about and what we've done and, and obviously to help sell the book for TPI to raise some money for veterans. And if... People, if, if, if we can give that platform to people where it's, it's a long form interview, there's no, there's no mediation. We're not beholden to any stakeholders or, or corporates or anything. You can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, we just sit down and chew the fat and get some good stories out there. And not only would that give them an opportunity to tell the stories, but veterans and the basic community to hear them, um, in a, a clear and entertaining way, which is what we're going to try and do. No, that was so good for today. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. So look out for podcast number two. Podcast number two. Yeah, thank you, Gordo. Um, no worries. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, it's absolute pleasure. Is there anything else you... Yeah, there was something I, I think you should thank uh, your wife for allowing <laughs> you to do this book. And I thank yeah. my darling wife, Shona, and my four children. I laugh there because there's a bit of a backstory. During the launch um, in Melbourne, I um, if you look at the back of the book, there's two full pages with about 200 names of people that we wanted to thank in the making of this book. And I flashed it up on the screen and said, they're the people who helped. I can't name them all. But I intended in my speech then to to um, to stop and to thank my wife because she has been unbelievable. And I forgot. I totally forgot. I was so nervous. And I just moved on. And she, to her credit, she didn't notice. She wasn't worried. But I did notice. So self-inflicted penance um, as I'm doing book signings around the country and, and public speaking about what we've done. Um, the the self-inflicted penance is that I thank my wife. Every time. I'm not going to do it in every podcast. That would get a little bit annoying. But um, so, yeah, good call, Gordo. Thank you, Kathy. I love you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I think that's it. So we'll, we will, we will, we're happy to take emails um, 
and uh, we, we can be contacted through the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers Facebook page if you would be interested in coming in and talking to us or if you've got any ideas um, from people. As I said, we do have some really big names that, that uh, and some wonderful stories to tell and we will release those probably through that page for now and um, but we will set up a dedicated Facebook page and website for this podcast very very soon thanks so much no worries look forward to the next one no worries let's get out of here yep thanks mate <laughs>